Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Mags, and I am an alcoholic, and it's so good to be here. I hope you don't mind me sharing, Kat, but the last time I physically met Kat was um, a few years ago. I had literally just been released from uh, a prison cell (laughs) where I had been detained um, because I had been caught drink driving. And that um, was a consequence and of my drinking. Um, and my friends in my home group, um, when I was released, uh, took me by the hand and never stopped giving me this solution that is Alcoholics Anonymous, this big book, The Twelve Steps, the program of recovery. Um, And as a result of that, I have ceased fighting alcohol. I've ceased fighting everything and everyone, even alcohol. I've gone from being an everyday drinker, 24 hours a day in the end, to not being affected by alcohol in any way, shape or form whatsoever now. I literally recoil from it like a hot flame. And I'll come on to those 10 step promises as I go through. Um, I'm just going to set a timer here because I am prone to um, rambling on, being Irish, you know, the old Blarney Stone and all of that. Um, So, yeah. My sobriety date is November 29th, 2019. It took me a few attempts to get to that sobriety date. In the end, I couldn't do it by myself. Like the newcomers in the room who have got three months, I couldn't do that on the outside world by myself. I had to be locked up. I was uh, went to a treatment facility where I lived for three and a half months. Because at that stage, I couldn't stop putting alcohol into my system. I was literally drinking against my will. I can remember standing in a kitchen and lifting a glass of wine to consume it and thinking and saying out loud to myself, I don't even want to do this. And lo and behold, the same cycle continued. I suffer from alcoholism, which is the utter inability to leave it alone. No matter how great the desire, the wish, or the urge, I cannot do this by myself. I need a power greater than myself. Alcohol, like it talks about in Chapter 5, how it works, is cunning, baffling, powerful. It has more strength than any human power. And without help, I will not survive. Without this power in my life, I'm doomed to an alcoholic death. That is the grave nature of alcoholism. And it tells us that right from the very beginning of this book. In the forewords, it tells us the grave nature of alcoholism, even before we get into the 164 pages, which holds that precious program of recovery where I become recovered from a hopeless state of mind and body and where I stay sober. And this book of mine is one is, is my most precious possession. It really and truly is. And I use it every single day. And the reason why I use it every single day is as I have had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps. And I try to carry this message and practice these principles in all my affairs. Every day, I sit with an alcoholic, one alcoholic with another, doing intense work, trying to help them 
take them by the hand, if you like, and place it into the hand of the God of their own understanding. This precious gift that has been given to me, I want to ensure I have a little army of people that are constantly doing this work because I am responsible. As that AA pledge tells me, when anyone reaches out the hand for help, I am responsible for carrying this message of Alcoholics Anonymous and nothing else. I'm an ex-problem drinker, armed with the facts about myself, and those facts are how I've recovered. You don't need to know anything about me. You don't need to know whether where I live, what I do for a living, whether I'm married, whether I have children, whether it doesn't matter. None of that is relevant, really, in the sense of I've had the spiritual awakening as the result of these steps. And you will find out about me as we, you know, go through these pages and we get to know each other. Of course, you will. But the only thing you really, truly need to understand is that I'm armed with the facts about myself as to how I recovered and how you can recover too. And I talk about all of that before we get into the detail of step 10, because obviously it's the 10th step. There's a lot of stuff that needs to happen in advance of that. And what I like to do is to dance through the pages. Um, and I was thinking before we got on here tonight, like, a I don't know, a slow waltz through the pages to get to step 10. Because there is a lot that needs to take place before we get to those beautiful daily reprieve steps. And I emphasize the word daily. <laughs> so, um. If you have your big book in front of you, which I hope you do because it's a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, <laughs> please open it up and let's dance this together. On page 59, you've got a list of the suggested steps in the program of recovery. Um, you know, when I first came into the rooms, I was told um, before I got to my home group, who are solely based in book study, solely based in Alcoholics Anonymous, the big book, but before I came into the rooms, I did go to other meetings that didn't use the big book. They didn't use Alcoholics Anonymous. And therefore, I picked up a lot of little bits and bobs that actually weren't from Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, but I'm very, very grateful to those rooms because ultimately I fell in love with the fellowship and they got me to my home group and they got me to the sponsor who now tells me the truth from the first 100 men and women that were so convinced by this solution that they took the painstaking time to write it down so that we could protect this solution and carry this message. And only this Friday, the 10th of June, is Founders Day. And, you know, there'll be a lot of people around the world celebrating the fact that this fellowship still exists. And if it's to continue for another 80 plus years, we are all responsible for carrying this message. It's that simple. So when I first came into the rooms as that newcomer, when I left, basically, well, let's start when I left the treatment facility. Two days after I left that facility, my younger sister gave me my cell phone back. And the first person I called was my sponsor because I knew at that point that I had to work these steps like the desperation of a drowning man. That's what it tells me in the book and that's what I did. In step one, I have to understand what I suffer from. I sit and I listen to my sponsor who takes me through the doctor's opinion and the first 45 pages of the book to help me understand that I suffer from a physical allergy, that once I put alcohol in, I can't stop drinking. I have an abnormal reaction to a very normal substance that other people can drink normally and I can't. When I stop taking the alcohol in, I then have this mental obsession. I understand that my alcoholism centers, my illness centers in my mind. And in order for me to straighten out physically and mentally, I have to solve this spiritual malady that I have, this spiritual condition that I have. So I sit and I listen to my sponsor and they take me through step one, a self-diagnosis to admit, to let the idea in that I'm powerless over alcohol, that my life has become unmanageable. And as a result of that, I can then be able to move into step two, where I come to believe that this power greater than myself can restore me to alcohol, can restore me um, to sanity around alcohol. 
in step two, you know, the end of step one, I understand that lack of power is my dilemma. And where am I to find that power? Well, that's exactly the purpose of this book. If you're looking anywhere else as to where you're going to find that power that is required for you to recover from this hopeless state of mind and body, I don't know where else to tell you to go. But to stay in these pages would be the best solution, the simplest solution for you. Because the common solution is what the first 100 men and women tell us in these pages. So having come to believe that this power greater than myself can restore me to sanity because we agnostics, chapter four, never stops giving me the reason why I need to have this power in my life. My own conception of God, not yours, not anybody else's, my own conception of God. I sit and I listen as my sponsor brings me through those pages. And again, I sit and I listen when I get into step three. And then I have to do a little bit of work here because I have to make this decision. It's not a huge amount of work. I have to make this. Well, I don't have to. But knowing what I know up to this point, I can make the decision to hand my will and my life over to the care of God as I understand him. And the reason why I'm making that decision is because I now understand what I suffer from physically, mentally, spiritually. I understand that I can't run the show any longer. I understand that selfishness, self-centeredness is the root of my problem and I must be rid of it. I must or it kills me. That's the how and the why of it. I take this position where I have this new employer. God becomes the director. I'm no longer running the show. He's the father. I'm the child. He's the principal, I'm the agent, and as his agent, I go out and try to do his work well. My little plans and designs no longer matter. It tells us that on page 63, those third step promises, milestones, whatever you want to call them. And as I move, having made that decision, asking God to take all of my difficulties, relieving me of the bondage of self, I start the work. I get into the work. I complete a fearless and thorough moral inventory of myself. I admit it to God, to myself and to another human being, the exact nature of my wrongs. I illuminate every twist of character, go into every dark cranny of my past. And as a result of that, I am able to sit alone at perfect peace and ease and review those first five proposals and understand whether I'm willing to go into step six, to let go of the things that I've been clinging to, those objectionable things that I've been clinging to which I've identified in my step four, the selfishness, the dishonesty, the self-seeking, the fear, how I am affected by my pride, my self-esteem, my personal relationships affected, and, 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 all of those things that are in that third column. And in my step seven, I ask God to take all of me, good and bad, but only when I'm ready, only when I'm ready. And to be ready means to be in fit condition for immediate use because when I move from seven into eight I'm going into um, this course of action again where I'm doing a drastic self-appraisal of all of the people that I've harmed and I'm going out to do his bidding now. Six and seven is a real turning point here as we move into ten as well a real turning point am I willing I've all, you know, that's absolutely and utterly indispensable the whole way through the program, the willingness, the honesty and the open mindedness. I was willing to do this. I was not opposed to in mind doing this work. I was willing because the great persuader, that being alcohol, it brought me to my knees to a near death experience where I had no other option than to accept the spiritual help that's laid out in this book. And to accept the spiritual help from the God of my own understanding. And when I did seek him, God could and would if he were sought. God has and will continue if I continue to seek. So I go out on that journey and I start those amends. I fit myself to be of maximum service to God and to those about me. The shift continues to change. This is no longer about me. This is about how my conscious contact with God, improving my conscious contact with God and ensuring that I do his work well. And by the time I get to step 10, we have all of these promises that genuinely have come true. 
the step three promises, the step five promises, the step nine promises. If we are painstaking about this phase of our development, we'll be amazed before we're halfway through. We'll be amazed before we're halfway through our amends, not halfway through the program. Amazed before we're halfway through these amends. They will always materialize if we work for them. And the word if is mentioned through these pages so many, many times. And it's very, very conditional. If I do the work, I get this way of living. If I don't do the work, I don't get this way of living. They will always materialize if we work for them. And this thought brings us to step 10. This thought brings us to step 10, that we have to work for them. And what is step 10? It suggests that we continue to take personal inventory and continue to set right any new mistakes as we go along. So we've already taken that inventory in four. We've established the selfishness, the dishonesty, the resentment and the fear. We've looked at the things that have been affected in our column three. This time around, when I did my inventory, I'm hugely affected by pride. What I think you think of me will kill me. (laughs) Because what I think you think of me becomes my reality. And I then start to behave in a way that that reality is true. When in actual fact, what you, what, what I think I think of you hasn't even happened. And I change my behaviors as a result of that. And because of my pride, I then go into this head spin of not having great self esteem either. So what I think you think of me isn't even real, but I have this self esteem problem goes up, going on, which then impacts on my personal relationships, my sex relationships, um, my, my fear, my resentments, selfishness, dishonesty. It's just this whole eruption of stuff happens unless I continue to watch for those things that I identified as my defects that had been shown to me so clearly when I admitted them to God, to myself and another human being in five. And I continue to set right any mistakes as I go along. Today, I can't hold on to these things. Today, this beautiful spiritual toolkit that has been led at my feet gives me the opportunity to write things as I go along. And it gives me very clear cut directions as to how about how I go about doing that. We vigorously commence this way of living. Vigorous means to carry out energetically. (laughs) We move from a nice slow waltz into a Charleston or something like that. I don't know. (laughs) Or the hokey cokey, whatever dance you prefer. Um, But we carry this, we carry this out every day energetically. You know, this is, this is me being filled with physical or mental strength to continue to watch for these things. In this way of living, as we clean up the past, so this road is is going parallel. As I'm cleaning up my side of the street, as I'm doing my step nine, I'm continuing to watch in step 10. And then I'm doing 11, sinking through prayer meditation, and I'm sponsoring other people. The daily reprieve steps 10, 11, and 12, as I'm cleaning up the past. So I don't have to wait on the hundreds of thousands of of, of resentments and and, um, amends being made. I'm doing that as I go along. Because by doing the amends as I go along, I'm revealing these layers and these tissues of myself when people have these conversations with me. I'm allowing God to shine some light on what these defects of character are and how I can amend these relationships and give them light and make them better again. I can understand how my pride is really impacting people, you know, and I can correct these things now as I go along. My default position is to go back to the selfishness, the dishonesty, resentment and fear. But by practicing this daily reprieve, this step 10 every single day, I become more awake to it. I'm becoming awake as I'm going through all of this. We've entered the world of the spirit. We've just opened the door. This is not an overnight matter. It's definitely not an overnight matter. And it tells us how long it goes on for. It should continue for our lifetime. (laughs) How straightforward is that? Every day for the rest of our life, we continue to watch for selfishness, dishonesty, resentment and fear. And what do we then do about them when they crop up? We ask God to remove them. That's all we do. 
we ask God to remove them. God, remove this fear. Don't know what's happening with me at the moment. Please, God, remove the fear. And when I ask, I then, I'm watching for it. I know that it's there. I continue to watch for those things. I ask God to remove it. And then if I've harmed somebody, I discuss it with somebody. Now, you will know most times when you've actually harmed somebody. But if you're a little bit confused, then you pick up the, I pick up the phone to my sponsor or another ex-problem drinker who has recovered and has had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps. I call them and say, mm, I'm not so sure, blah, blah, blah. And yeah, I hang out with people that are really honest. I hang out with people that will say, yeah, Max, you definitely need to make an amends on that one because you were truly selfish. Because sometimes I can block it off. Sometimes I can mask it. You know, even though my motives are good, I still might have harmed somebody. And I have to be responsible for that. But sometimes I need to talk to somebody completely independent because I can mask that. That ego sitting on my on my shoulder can just say, oh, Max, no. You were filled with the right intention there. Well, I still harmed somebody, so I need to do something about it. So when they crop up, I ask God to remove it. And and if I don't make amends and it's, I don't need to make amends, and that's okay, I carry on through my day. It tells us what to do. If, if, if I have fear, for example, and it's not shifting, it then tells me to resolutely turn my thoughts to someone we can help. So I'm watching, I'm turning. I'm watching, I'm asking, I'm turning. I watch for it. I ask God to remove it and I turn my thoughts. I resolutely turn my thoughts and resolutely means to intently, purposely, tirelessly turn my thoughts to someone else until it starts to lift, until it starts to shift. I don't just sit back and go, all right, I'm just going to sit in this fear for 10 hours or I'm just going to sit and complain to my friends about this for 10 hours. No, I have to take the action. I have to do something about it. It's in the chapter into action, by the way. Step 10, into action. And by resolutely turning my thoughts, now don't get me wrong, I'm not Mother Teresa. I'm not running about the streets of Belfast trying to help people off the streets and all of that, but I'm resolutely turning my thoughts. It may well be that I turn my thoughts to call a sponsee. It may well be that I turn my thoughts to write in a card to somebody. But as, as, as long as I'm getting away from what is going on inside my head, because by resolutely turning my thoughts to someone else, somehow it gets me out of this control tower that's my head. It takes me into my heart where my creator has most definitely entered. You know, on page 25, the first 100 talk about, that's the miracle of it, that, you know, their creator has entered into their heart in a way that is miraculous. That has That is what has happened with my life. As I've done this work, I get out of this control tower where my illness centers and I get into my heart into, and I tap into that inner resource, that great reality. That's where... God may only be found. That's what, what the first 100 tell us. By sweeping away the prejudice, by taking away the blocks. You know, my alcohol was but a symptom. The causes and the conditions were this selfishness and everything that was blocking me off. But now I've cleared all of that at step 10. It becomes this amazing way of, of living where love and tolerance is now my code. Because step 10, 11 and 12 is not about me feeling better. It's about my relationship with God, improving my conscious contact with God. If I was to dial Kat, if she was in America, I have to use an international dialing code to connect with her. With God, the code is love and tolerance is my code. My international dialing code to God is love and tolerance is my code. I dial that code. And all of a sudden I get in touch with the God of my understanding and everything changes. The landscape of everything changes. Now, the thing about it is, it's really interesting. We first hear about step 10 on page 13 in Bill's story. There's one line that he talks about it. He says, I was to test my thinking by the new God consciousness within. Common sense would thus become uncommon sense. When I first enter this world of the spirit in step 10, common sense becomes uncommon sense. It doesn't make sense to me. It doesn't make sense to me that I'm continuing to watch for selfishness, dishonesty, resentment and fear because those were the levers that got me everything that I wanted in my alcohol days. 
So this feels like uncommon sense, but the more we practice it, it becomes common sense again and becomes this way of living. And, you know, it tells us on page 51, this is where we're still in we agnostics. On page 51, I love this. It says, leaving aside the drink question. By that stage, when I'm in step two, I've left aside the drink question because I understand from step one that I'm powerless. I understand that I'm powerless physically, mentally. I have the spiritual malady and my life has become unmanageable. I understand that lack of power is my dilemma. My life is unmanageable because of the lack of power. And I now need this power in my life to function. To grow in understanding and effectiveness. To become more aware of God. To get closer to God. To build my relationship with God. That's what we're doing in step five. You know, we're on this road of having this new attitude and this new relationship with the God of our understanding. But on 51, it says, leaving aside the drink question, they tell why living was so unsatisfactory. They show how the change came over them. When many hundreds of people are able to say that the consciousness of the presence of God is today the most important fact of their lives, they present a powerful reason why one should have faith. Now, there's a bit of a myth as well, sometimes in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, where they say on 51, you leave aside the drink question and you never hear about it again. Well, you do. You actually hear about it again. You hear about it on 58, cunning, baffling, powerful. You hear about it on 66, the insanity of alcohol returns to drink is to die. You hear about it on 70, we are sure to drink again. You hear about it on 72, we may not overcome drinking. You hear about it on 76, We need to go to any lengths for victory over alcohol. So we've left aside the drink question. We know what we suffer from. But what it's telling us is, is if we don't do the work, the alcohol thing will return. Therefore, this daily reprieve contingent on my spiritual condition, 10, 11 and 12, is so important. And as a result of continuing to do this work, the 10 step promises have come true in my life. I have ceased fighting anything and anyone, even alcohol. Because by this stage, sanity has returned. I've gone from not questioning the alcohol thing in step two to actually now being not a thing in my life. And I can remember my sponsor saying to me when I got to this point in the book, when was the last time you thought about alcohol? And I'm thinking, well, I don't really know. Well, when when was it? Did you did you have you thought about it? Yeah, I have. When I was at a bus stop the other day, I saw a really cool advert for a Jack Daniels. Well, how did you react? Well, I just thought that was a really cool Jack Daniels. I didn't think that I needed to go to the pub to grab one like I would have done normally. I react sanely and normally. That is the miracle of it. It just comes. It just happened. All I did was sit with my sponsor and turn the pages. All I did was when they give me an instruction, I took the action. When the first 100 men and women ask a question, they actually give us the answer. There was very little for me to do. I just had faith in the process. I kept turning the pages and all of a sudden things started to happen. The alcohol thing was no longer an issue for me. We hadn't even sworn off. That is our experience, is what they say to us on page 85. And that is certainly my own personal experience. And that is how I react so long as I keep in fit spiritual condition. And how I keep in fit spiritual condition is that I don't rest on my laurels. Over this weekend, I don't know how many telephone calls I had from um, other women, not all of them my own sponsees, but women saying, you know, we all hear this, don't we? I want what you have. Really? You want what I have? (laughs) Come and spend the day with me and see what that entails. The prayer, the meditation, the constant work, the constant interaction with other alcoholics, you know, the the absolute resolutely doing all of this work. It's my prescription for the progressive illness that I suffer from. So if you want what I have, come join the party. If you want what I have, come do the work. If you want what I have, let's live this way of living. Because it's the best party I've ever been at, ever been at. And there's not a piece of alcohol in sight. You know, I can't rest on my laurels because I know that I'm headed for trouble. I know that I'm headed for trouble, cunning, baffling, powerful. 
without help, it is too much for us. And my my job now is to maintain the spiritual condition. I maintain it. I do the work. I continue to watch for these things. I I resolutely turn my thoughts. And page 20, it tells us again, and um, it's in there is a solution. My very life as an ex-problem drinker depends on my constant thought of others. It's dead simple. My constant thought of others. And it doesn't mean to say that I'm running about, like I said, like Mother Teresa before, but I constantly think of other people because it takes me away from myself. And by maintaining that attitude, that certain simple attitude that it talks about throughout the book, by maintaining that condition, God sorts out the condition. I just need to maintain it. It's like, you know, if I have a car, I fill it with water. So the windscreen wipers clean the windscreen. I maintain that, the condition of it, the the mechanic does all of that stuff. As long as I do here on this earth, maintain this every day, God sorts all the other problems out. This program has solved all my problems. I have loads of problems, but they're just over there in the background somewhere. Because whilst I'm doing his work well, he's sorting everything else out. And I call him he because it's easier for me. And every day is a day. It tells us this in the book. This is how simple this thing is. Every day we must, must. I was told when I came into the rooms, first, there are no musts in AA. Really? Well, in my book, in the 164 pages, there's 52 times where the word must means must. You must have a higher power. We must be rid of selfishness and self-centeredness or it kills us. We must go through every day carrying the vision of God's will into our activities. How can I best serve thee? Thy will be done, not mine. My little plans and designs no longer matter. Thy will be done, not mine. And these go along with us constantly, constantly, constantly. And, you know, sometimes schizophrenic sounds like a, it sounds like a really negative thing to say but I, and I, I don't I can't find another word perhaps my friend Stan will be able to give me a word to to describe what this is because he's much more wisdom and experience than I have in all of this stuff um but you know I go through my day and it's great I love it I'm constantly watching myself watch us turn watch us turn I'm, I and I'm, I'm constantly saying they will be done not mine they will be done not mine I'm, I'm using that set aside prayer set aside everything I think I know for this new experience. But because I'm working the spiritual condition and muscle all the time, it just becomes a way of living. It just becomes something where you glide through the day. It doesn't feel like work any longer. It just becomes a part of the makeup. And I know when I'm going into self-reliance. And I know when I am purely in God-reliance. And, you know, I had, a, I had a bit of a difficult decision to make this week. Well, I didn't really have a difficult decision to make if I had it tuned into the God reliance, because what I was running on was self-reliance, the proper use of the will. I was running on my own will. And I was causing myself agony. I was clinging on to the objectionable items, items in my makeup that were causing me pain, distress, emotion. I was clinging on for dear life. And last night, it got to the point where it was too much for me. And I just said, God, you got to tell me. My God was literally standing in front of me. And I kept pushing him out of the way. And I asked God, I was ready to ask God to tell me, what is it you need me to do now? Because I can't cope with this any longer. And I woke up this morning, done. I knew the action that I had to take. And I called my sponsor, who completely and utterly understood completely and utterly understood but I had thought my will was being done not thy will be done it is the proper use of the will and you know for me I'm a big book study person I love this big book I can quote the pages I can give you the definitions but it means nothing unless I'm living it. I have to understand the theory. I do. I have to understand this. I have to be brought by the hand by a sponsor who understands all of this, who can give this gift to me, who can get my hand into the God of my understanding so that I can then pass it on 
to somebody else to ensure they get the God of their understanding into their life. And in understanding what these 100 men and women were so convinced by, you know, they're so convinced by this that they beg us twice. They beg us to lay aside our prejudice. They beg us to be fearless and thorough from the very outset because they know this works. It works. It really does. I've gone from somebody that drank 24-7 for nearly 30 years, and now I don't. All because of what you pointed me towards, which was the God of my understanding, a program of recovery, which means I can stay sober. No matter what, I can face those certain, most definite trials and low spots ahead as long as I maintain the spiritual condition and allow God's will to be done, not mine. And you know, for any of the newcomers in the room, I spent 18 months in the rooms, in the illness, looking at and pointing at people, judging people, having opinions on people, and all the while this progressive illness was dragging me down faster than a train going down a really, really short track, and I did not even realise it. I spent too much time giving opinions and judgment and pointing at you rather than looking at what you were pointing me towards which was this solution that solves all our problems. And by the grace of God, I hung out with a group of people that told me the truth from this book. And thank God, I was able to accept it, wholeheartedly accept it. And by the grace of God, my work, my job, my only job is to be helpful to you. My only job is to pass this on. And I get paid in abundance for it. I get paid in peace, serenity, power, strength, direction. What more could one want? And the ability to be true to myself and talk to other individuals to say, do you know what? I'm not going to do that because I'm no longer a people pleaser. I'm not going to do that because right now it's just not okay. Just now I need to be here. And I'll leave it at that, Kat. I hope that made some sense. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.